reading of the Stratford Board of Education order at 7.13 on August 22nd. My name is Andrew Corbin, I'm the board chair. We do have an in-person quorum and Mr. Kennedy is joining us virtually so he will be able to vote with us this evening. Um, Mrs. Wilsey, will you please, please lead us in the pledge and invitation? Yes, please stand. We beseech you, almighty God, to bless this meeting of the Board of Education. So guide and rule over our hearts and minds that all our deliberations and decisions may be in accordance with your will and lead to the advancement and welfare of the community of Stratford for whom we serve. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Seeing as we have a wonderful number of uh, folks out tonight for our public forum, I will entertain a motion to amend our agenda and move the public forum to our first item. So moved by Ms. Cupy, second by Ms. Bedell. All in favor? Aye. Great. Aye. Oh, thank you, Sean. Uh, so we will move to our public forum um, and welcome our Stratford residents to uh, speak tonight. Uh, you will be given three minutes. Mrs. Wilsey will help keep track of time for you. Um, when you come to uh, the microphone up there, please state your name and your address. Uh, and our first speaker this evening is Ms. Hemingway. Good evening. My name is Sasha Hemingway. I live at 108 Stratford Road. Again, like I said, my name is Sasha Hemingway. I'm blessed to be the mother of, of nine-year-old boy-girl twins who attend St. James School. I'm here to publicly speak against the Stratford <coughs> Public Schools decision to eliminate a full-time nurse at St. James. According to Connecticut General Statute, Stratford Public Schools are required by law to provide the same health services to students who attend private school as they do to for students who attend public school. My nine-year-old son has severe von Willebrand's disease. Von Willebrand's disease is a genetic bleeding disorder that causes the blood to not clot, clot properly. This can cause internal bleeding or bleeding out. Due to my son's condition, all injuries need to be evaluated and treated much differently than most kids. There is no daily medication my son can take to prevent internal bleeding or bleeding out. His medication is given to him in the emergency room by IV. My son has had this IV treatment several times, and every time getting him to the ER quickly has been crucial. Having a nurse who understands his condition and knows how to evaluate and treat him for non-critical injuries is essential. Not having a nurse on site during the school day leaves me fearful. What happens if he's injured? Who will assess his injury? Will they understand his condition? What will happen to him if his injury is not visibly critical and ignored? This is not something that should be put on someone who is not a trained medical professional. And it's not just my son. There are so many kids in the school who have their own medical issues, asthma, severe allergies, etc. Having a full-time nurse should not be something that you consider. This is an essential need for all students. These are all kids who want to learn and grow and deserve the same health services that their friends in public school get. Proper medical care is not a luxury, it's a need. I urge you to please adhere to the law and reinstate full-time nurses at private schools. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker will be Ms. Martin. Hi, my name is Dr. Allison Martin. I live at 335 York Street. I am the parent of a sixth grader at St. James School. I'm also the director of the graduate and undergraduate special ed programs at Fairfield U. I'm here to speak on behalf of both St. James and St. Mark's School. As you know, Stratford Public School is required by law to provide the same health services to students attending private schools as those attending public. This is according to Connecticut General Statute, School Health and Sanitation Section. Each town, and I quote, each town or regional school district which provides health services for children attending its public schools in any grade from kindergarten to 12, inclusive, mm -hmm. shall provide the same health services for children in such grades attending private, nonprofit schools. From what I understand, the board and Dr. O'Sunday have difficulty understanding the definition of the word same. 
According to the Oxford Dictionary, the word same is defined as identical, not different. Therefore, St. James and St. Mark's must be provided with the same amount and level of school nursing services that the public schools in the district are provided. I'll state the obvious reasons why the district must provide the same nursing services to all students in the town of Stratford, regardless of public or private schools. Roughly 80% of students from St. James and St. Mark's are from families that reside in Stratford. Therefore, they are taxpayers. To be exact, there are 335 students from both schools who pay tax dollars to the town of Stratford. These 335 families are providing the town with tax dollars to pay salaries, all district expenses, and district resources. The only resources these 335 families benefit from are two full-time nurses, one at each school, bus service, and extremely minimal services for students with special needs. What would happen if 335 students enrolled in public school in Stratford this coming year? What would your budget look like then? Where would you put them? How many teachers would you need to hire to support them? According to the Board of Ed meeting in May, Dr. Osunde stated, there's no wiggle room in the budget for even an influx of 100 students. Every single classroom is capped. I am by no means a financial expert, but it seems fairly obvious that paying two full-time nurses to serve at St. James and St. Mark's requires significantly less financial resources than having to pay for 335 additional students in the Stratford District. As of June, the governor still declared our state in a state of emergency due, the, due to the pandemic. Pulling a full-time school nurse during a pandemic is not only absurd, it is neglect. What will happen to the students who have asthma attacks, allergic reaction, broken bones, or require medication throughout the day? Our emergency services in our town, such as EMS, fire, and police, prepared to handle numerous calls from both schools for non-emergency situations that should be handled by a school nurse. If you think the job of a school Thank nurse- Thank you, I'm sorry, that's three minutes. Thank you for your time. My name is Megan Merwin. I live at 161st Ave, Stratford. I'm a mom of four uh, who go to St. James School, and I'm speaking on behalf of Chris Robertson, principal at St. James School, and Melissa Warner, principal at St. Mark's School. Since they are not Stratford residents, they are not permitted to speak. They would like to thank you for this opportunity to share the statement with you. As school administrators, they understand the fiduciary responsibility that you have to the community and certainly know that in your role of Board of Ed members, you need to examine situations from different angles and elevations. They have asked me not to reread the letter that they sent you last week, that they formally stated their objection to the Board's decision to reduce our nurses. They trust that you have reviewed the details of those letters carefully and considered its content. However, they do wish to emphasize a few key points in this forum. The Board of Ed's decision to implement a budgetary reduction causing one full-time nurse position to be eliminated, thus creating one split nurse between St. James and St. Mark's School is a violation of Connecticut law. Connecticut General Statute 10-217A states in part that each town or regional school district which provides health services for children attending public schools in any grade from kindergarten to 12th shall include and provide the same health services to children in those grades um, attending private non-profit non schools Therein, the majority of the children attending such schools are residents of the state of Connecticut. Further, said, uh, the state's uh, mandate says, such health services shall include the services of a school physician, school nurse, etc. The definition of the word same is identical, not different. The Catholic schools in Stratford not only deserve, but require that the Board of Ed provide the same health services to the children who attend their Catholic schools. In addition to following the law, it is also uh, fiscally responsible. A failure to reinstate full-time nurses at each school and reverse its unlawful budgetary reduction is a violation of the state statute and may subject the Stratford Public Schools and the Board of Ed to a liability, especially should a student be injured or ill on school grounds and the said injury is exacerbated due to the lack of a resident nurse. In addition, we are still in the middle of a global pandemic and it is not over. On June 28th, our, 28th, our governor made a public de declaration to continue the health emergency until December 28th of 2022. And it continues to exist throughout the state of Connecticut. 
None of us have a blueprint or an outline of the course that COVID will take in our state or in our wider society. New strands continue to emerge and we do not know the long-term effects that COVID has on children who have been infected. Simply put, to reduce health services in our schools during a public health emergency continues to put our children at great risk. In addition, should a spike in COVID cases resurface again in our communities, we will need a school nurse in both schools full time. All of us witnessed the necessity of school nurses in our schools during COVID. They are indeed heroes and we're literally saving lives and helping our schools function, cope, manage. Thank you, I'm sorry. Okay. And I have a petition with over a thousand signatures, so I'm not sure who receives that. Thank you to the board for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the St. Mark staff and, and teachers and the children in our school. Um, my name is Mike Malika and I'm a resident of 160 Butternut Lane. I've been a resident of Stratford for 38 years and my two sons have both been with the Stratford Public School System. So I had the opportunity to not only read line by line for the budget that you presented, I also watched the workshops that you did on YouTube which were if anybody had the opportunity to watch them, I think they'd be as proud as I was to see the work that this board has done and the care that you put in to what you're charged to do for the kids in our town. I think it was very, very admirable and it's a very tough decision on those that you had to make. So with that in mind, I'm also a board member on the Stratford uh, school system, on, on the uh, St. Mark School. So one of the things that I looked at that stood out to me is, you know, we put together what we thought was a well put together proposal back to you folks on what we thought were good uh, positions that we had. They were objective, they were data filled, and I think they make a lot of sense and the people who spoke today, I think reiterated that. When I looked at this and I looked at the positions that would be eliminated, it's $66,000 I think is what the budget line item was. When you consider in section 112 where that resides along with custodial services, the custodial services were almost $3 million with 2.5 million being Salaries and another $500,000 was overtime. That's 17% of the total expense on custodial services that we're spending in overtime. And in the year of COVID, when we had a reduced amount of students at school, it was about 280 some odd thousand dollars that was spent in overtime. And I, I'm just trying to figure out where that might be. So I'm asking you as a possible solution to the problem that we have of bringing back a full-time nurse, Maybe there's some dollars that could be looked at in that same section of the budget, section 112, where both reside, and I think $66,000 to figure out how you can get a full-time nurse, the benefit of that is gonna far exceed any pain that may come from eliminating some of the overtime. It's obvious we keep tremendous care of our schools. You look around every day, they're kept beautifully. Now, I'm sure there's room that we could probably make some sacrifices there to put together a program to bring a full-time nurse back to our school. So I appreciate it, thank you, and I hope you'll consider our proposal. Spruce Street. Good evening. I'm a lifelong resident of Stratford and a parent of a second grade and kindergarten student at St. James School. I've also been a pediatric emergency room nurse for the past 11 years. I'm speaking to you today regarding what I feel is a dangerous situation that will be created in at St. Mark's and St. James School by reducing the school nurse positions to part-time. It is without question that students need the services of a school nurse now more than ever before. On a daily basis, Nurses are needed to administer critical medications such as insulin, maintenance and rescue inhalers, epinephrine, anti-seizure and behavioral medications along with students who become sick or injured. Reducing the nurses to part-time means that when they are not available, these tasks will have to be handled by untrained and unlicensed staff members. That is totally unacceptable. 
Based on my experience as a healthcare professional and a mother, I urge the board to immediately restore the funds so that both schools can have a full-time nurse. If that is not possible, my recommendation to the administrators for both schools is to establish a policy of activate, activating EMS response for all medical incidents within the school to ensure the students are cared for by trained medical responders. This would not be an ideal situation and would be a waste of EMS resources, but would provide more appropriate care than placing the responsibilities on teachers and administrators. While, I'm, while my appeal to you is based on the safety of the students, I've heard other parents claim that reducing the nurses to part-time may violate Connecticut general statutes regarding health services for children in private nonprofit schools. I am not a lawyer, so I do not know the details, but the <clears throat> fact that the state recognizes the importance of ensuring healthcare services provided to private school students, so much so that they have statutes on it, makes me wonder how the board ever came to, to the decision to cut these positions. I understand the board is divided on this issue as shown by the four to three vote. I hope for the well-being of the students that the board will reconsider the decision and vote to restore the nursing positions to full time. Finally, I thank you for your dedication and service for the school children in Stratford. My name is Dan Schultz. I live at 586 Riverdale Drive. I'm a very proud father of two young sons, one going into second grade and one going into kindergarten at the St. James School. I am here today to strongly oppose the decision by the Stratford Public Schools to eliminate a full-time nurse at the St. James School and subsequently the St. Mark School. I'm shocked, frustrated, and angry that any issue regarding the health and safety of our children is even a discussion. The Connecticut State Statute clearly, and I repeat, clearly states, each town or regional school district which provides health services for children attending its public schools in any grade from kindergarten to 12, sh inclusive, shall provide the same health services for children in such grades attending private nonprofit schools. Now it is my understanding that there have been liberties taken by the board and the administration with interpretation of words and statute. So let us narrow our focus to the following excerpt. Shall provide the same health services. According to Oxford Dictionary, shall is defined as expressing an instruction or command. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines same as identical, no difference. To draw a comparison that may appeal to the interests of the board and the administration, I reference Dr. Asani's employment contract where the word shall and same appear as follows. The board shall provide to the superintendent the same health insurance plan subject to the same cost share contribution as is provided to the members of the SAA. I find it noteworthy that the board administration have construed and contorted words in a Connecticut state statute pertaining to the health of our children while they have the same wording in the employment contract with our superintendent, superintendent pertaining to his health. With the board's and administration's decision to limit St. James School to a part-time nurse, the children will effectively have 50% less health services than other public schools. Does the board believe, due to the wording in his contract, that they can now reduce Dr. Asande's health coverage by 50%? I wouldn't think so. But then why is it okay for the students? The simple answer is, it is not. You, the Board of Education and Administration, are violating a Connecticut state statute as our children have the legal right to a full-time nurse as provided to public schools. You are cutting costs at the expense of our children. The same children who have just endured the physical, emotional, mental anguish of a pandemic. I strongly encourage you to reconsider your position and reinstate a full-time nurse at St. James and St. Mark's, failing which, I will have no further option, no further choice but to escalate this matter to state level through political, media, and legal means.
Furthermore, and unless you alter your position, I will hold you all responsible for any consequences Thank to you. my I'm children sorry. That's three minutes. for your failure to provide them the health services they are legally entitled to. Here, we're here because we're scared. We're scared for our children. My daughter is four years old and she has an anaphylactic reaction to eggs. And St. Mark's is not an egg free school. So, I just hope that you guys can see that this room would not be filled with these people if we weren't here because our children are the only priority in our lives. So, my daughter Lauren, who's four, um, has an anaphylactic response to consuming eggs. She's attending St. Mark's school where eggs are allowed because of. That's just how things are, right? Nuts are okay, but different things aren't. Um, she has to have an Avi Q. I don't know if you guys have seen one. I brought one with me in case you haven't, but that has to be administered into her if she consumes an egg. I just want to know who's going to be doing this. My mother-in-law is a teacher at St. James School, and for her to be asked to have to do this to a child, I just think is almost, it's just not right, I guess. Um, what if the days are wrong? What if the nurse we thought was at St. James was at St. Mark's and vice versa? Who has the keys? Who knows what's going on? It's, I think it's really challenging to ask teachers who have children that they're taking care of and teaching to also be responsible for what the schedules are for the nurses. Anyone who has a child who has an anaphylactic reaction knows that immediate response is the only way to solve the issue. We can't call an EMT. We can't wait. I live three feet from St. Mark's School, and I'm going to work from home, so that if anything happens to my daughter, I can run there and save her. Eggs can be found anywhere. Baked goods, glazed breads, or even found in ice cream. This can't be seen by your eyes. If my daughter gets something, she can't read the back of a package to see whether or not it contains eggs. And because of that, I'm scared, and that's why I'm here tonight. So I moved to Stratford because I wanted to be in a safe place for my daughter, and I just don't want to regret that decision. Thank you.
call the meeting back to order at 7.42, and we will move on to Dr. Sunday's presentation of the Strategic Operating Plan. Uh, thank you, uh, Board Chair. Uh, good evening to our families, good evening to our audience here. I am excited, uh, along with my colleagues, uh, members of the district leadership team, to um, present to the board and our community our new district strategic plan. Uh, before we actually get into the presentation slides, I just want to ask Mr. Rivers, our director of technology, to um, really just kind of scroll through the documents so people get a good visual of what we'll, uh, we'll, we'll cover in the next couple of slides. That's a good picture. <laughs> um, I am personally excited uh, in this work that we do uh, at the system level. We always talk about um, having a plan that guides the way we go about making decisions, um, not just from a budgetary standpoint, but also uh, in terms of the work that we do in each classroom. Uh, Mr. Rivers, I'm going to ask you to go to the slides. So today, you'll see your presentation. Uh, what I will do is introduce the strategic plan and then we'll have a team who will each speak uh, to some of the strategies around some of the priority areas. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanna share, I wanna start with the impetus for the work. Uh, a few years ago, okay, um, in 2019, the Board of Education undertook a project to identify the key attributes, dispositions that they felt would be important for our children who go through our schools, walk through our hallways, and ultimately graduate from our stages, uh, both at Bunnell High School and Stratford High School. What skills, competencies, and dispositions do they need to embody and have in order to thrive when they leave beyond the borders of our community, the town of Stratford, or if they choose to stay here in Stratford? That project was the portrait of a graduate. Um, coincidentally, our existing strategic plan was also scheduled to sunset uh, this past year. So it was perfect timing for us to begin to find a way to create a new roadmap and fuse it with the objectives of the portrait of a graduate. Uh, we began our process last winter by taking a deep, deep dive into our data and then having vulnerable conversations by putting together a team, a cross-section team that represented community members, Sterling House participate, we had community services participate, we had members of care participate, we had families include their voice in this process represented by members of Parent C. We had uh, certified staff members from every developmental level, elementary, middle, and high participate in this. We had administrators, we had board members. Uh, so as you can see, based on the list of uh, individuals and professionals that I just highlighted, there was a lot of authentic voice in determining what the priorities would be for our district as it relates to this strategic plan. Over the course of about seven or so sessions, um, we identified priorities that we felt would propel our work and allow us to start to begin to position our kids, pre-K through 12, to develop and acquire uh, the attributes consistent with the portrait of a graduate. <clears throat> Uh, next slide, please. So what you're going to see is a quick presentation. I'm going to give you a quick glance uh, as we continue to uh, uh, consider our work here in Stratford Public Schools. Uh, as many of you know, Stratford is uh, right around 15th or 16th largest school district in the state of Connecticut. We have approximately uh, 6,836 students in our, in our system, and that number changes every day. Of that student population, about 70% of them are students of color. That's roughly 4,700 students. 
And then when we take a look at our student demographics, we also, in this field of education, we always try to identify our students who we recognize as unique learners. For the purposes of this uh, demographic pie chart, um, you'll see that we have uh, special education in our second language learners highlighted here. Collectively, uh, they represent about 30% of our overall population or approximately uh, 18 and 1900 students. Uh, conceptually, uh, our talented and gifted students can fit into that pie chart as well. So the takeaway from this slide is that we are a very diverse school district uh, as far as the student population, but also with diverse student learning needs. Uh, next slide, please. Conversely, when we take a look at our staff, uh, and it's hard to see on this slide, but you'll be able to see it in the document. Uh, we have just over 1,000 professionals working uh, for the Board of Education. And of that staff, about 750 of them have less than 10 years of service. Approximately uh, 400 or so have uh, more than 10 years. The demographic breakdown, and this is a pretty interesting slide when you juxtapose it to the previous slide, right? Um, almost 1,000, about 900 of our uh, staff are white. Our black population is right around uh, 106. Our Hispanic uh, professionals, 100 in total, and our Asian uh, population professionals is at 14. Uh, there's another uh, data visualization to your right that shows that uh, approximately half of our staff, just a little bit uh, over half of our staff, are certified, comparative to our non-certified staff. Uh, next slide, please. So as we talk about the needs of our district, we recognize and we must be in a position to celebrate and highlight uh, the assets that come along with diversity. As I shared with you, we have about 6,800 kids and 70% uh, of them are students of color, but also embedded in that student population are, are 49 different languages. So there's some clear implications for what this means in terms of how we go about doing our work of teaching our kids in ways that are meaningful to them. Uh, the next uh, data slide uh, shows our operating budget, which the Board of Education adopted uh, this past, uh, in the early part of the summer. Going into this school year and this fiscal year, we will operate with the operating budget of $123.2 million to provide the resources and the talent and skills to make sure we, we meet our teaching and learning goals. Let's go to the next slide. Part of this process of coming up with a new strategic plan, uh, we had deep conversations, but this is something that we largely built consensus around, which is what would be our new vision, okay? What would be our new vision? And it made sense to us across the section of participants that we did not reinvent the wheel. We felt committed to these attributes and we felt that when kids graduate from either Bunnell or Stratford High School, a composition of these attributes will make them the best candidate in life, in work, or in further education. So as you look at the vision, uh, I will read to you um, exactly our belief system said that here at the Stratford Public Schools, it is our vision that each and every Stratford Public School student thrives in further education, career, and workplace opportunities, and life as a communicator. And we're talking about written or orally, a collaborator. What does it mean to be a teammate to address and respond to societal needs and solve problems? A lifelong learner. What does it mean to be curious? What does it mean to delve into inquiry? passionate and engaged community member, and we know that is uh, a necessity these days. Somebody who is anchored in solutions. Um, all of these attributes, we feel without a doubt, upon graduation, will position our kids to be the best candidate for anybody who's looking to add value to what they do. So how do we go about carrying this out? Uh, next slide, please. From the Board of Education, to our building administrators, uh, it must be our mission to make sure that we position our students to acquire those skills and attributes by endeavoring to support the growth of the whole student through a challenging and inspiring education, but also doing so within a safe and inclusive 
you know, highlight that word inclusive environment. That's a word that we've heard quite a bit about over the last uh, six to 10 months. Again, very impressed and very proud of the work of the, of the planning team. Um, as I mentioned, they highlighted five priority areas. Uh, I'm gonna ask you to go to the next slide, Mr. Rivers. That all schools uh, will begin to focus on. We've been having ongoing conversations and most recently today we had a seven hour workshop with our administrators. Our administrators have been working through the course of the summer to develop their individual school, school improvement plans, which um, embody a lot of these components of these priorities that were construed by the planning team. Uh, and there are in no particular rank order, we, we place equal value to all of these priorities. And what I will share with you um, that I'm particularly happy about in terms of how this came together is that should external conditions change over time, okay? Um, what has been identified by the planning team as priorities gives us the ability to remain agile. And with that, what I mean is, uh, let's say three years from now, conditions change. These priorities don't have to change. However, the strategies that support these five priorities can be adapted. So it allows the staff of public schools to be an agile educational institution. So the first priority you see there, again, this is in no particular order, is the overall well-being of students. We're looking to support the well-being and social emotional health of students. We know that over the last three years, this has been a, a, a prominent aspect of the work. We're looking to make sure we extend this and also extend this in a way that it's not uh, prompted uh, purely by the pandemic, but it's just good work to do for students. Uh, as the board is well aware, uh, we've been deep with the ruler, um, but there's a few other things that you'll see that show up uh, as strategies that the teams come up with. Meaningful learning. Uh, engagement, attendance, uh, culturally relevant learning, uh, based on the demographic data you've seen, these are all things that we need to continue to build our capacity around uh, to make sure that our kids are put in the most academically rigorous spaces and challenging spaces, so they're fully prepared to transition uh, after graduation, whether it's to community college, whether it's to trade school, uh, whether it's to a private exclusive college. We want Stratford kids to be the top selections wherever they go not just in the United States, but also across the globe. A plan for future success, this is an area of growth for us, um, but with this uh, priority, we're talking about creating systems that allow students, uh, as young as elementary school, to begin to develop agency around their interest, their passion, but how do we create the conditions and the systems um, to cultivate that, and also bring in our families into the conversation over the course of the 13 years that uh, the kiddos are here with us. Again, we can't do this work to impact uh, student learning experience and, and student outcomes without uh, a talented staff. We do have a ta talented staff here at the Stratford Public Schools, but uh, you know, as greedy as we are, we always want to make sure that anybody else that we add to our professional community is value added. So uh, you'll see some strategies there that, that speaks about recruiting, that speaks about diversifying, and again, I would reference uh, the slide with the demographic data. And how do we develop but also retain uh, outstanding uh, people to work with our kids and our family? And lastly, we talked about this this morning uh, with our administrators, the foundation for which we must build our work to teach um, our children is hands down based on the partnerships that we have with our families, the way we communicate with our families, and also how we extend educational experiences beyond the walls of our 13 schools. Um, and you know, if you're familiar with the Stratford Public Schools, you know we have some deep partnerships across uh, our community. Um, that was uh, impacted a little bit through the pandemic, but we are in the process of opening up our doors to bring them into the classrooms um, to support our learning and make, uh, make learning for our students a little bit more relevant and a little bit more meaningful and a little bit more practical. So with that said, I am actually going to call uh, on our first uh, presenter, uh, Ms. Heather Gorgeous will present on uh, the priority of uh, overall well-being. Hi, everybody. It's awesome to see everyone again, and welcome to a new school year. Um, over the course of a lot of weeks, there were many times that the term well-being came up. Okay, and under that umbrella of well-being are some pretty key areas. 
And so what I'm gonna highlight for you now is a little bit about what we're already doing and already started from the feedback we were given, but then also some stuff we're looking forward to the future, okay? So the other thing that's really, really important for you to know is that when everybody else gets up to speak, well-being is still in theirs too. It's actually threaded through the entire thing, okay? But I'm just gonna highlight a few key areas. So the first part of well-being that came up is safety. We all want our kids to be safe, right? It's the number one priority is making sure that we are keeping a good, safe environment. So we were fortunate enough that through a grant, we were able to secure a director of safety who will closely work with our buildings, our crisis teams, our SROs, our safety monitors, and our climate specialists to develop and refine safety strategies. Okay, we've already, on top of this, we've already begun using some digital resources in order to make sure we are keeping our students safe. You guys remember when we spoke about securely, right? So we monitor that, we respond, we have a team that responds. In the future, in the next three years, we wanna leverage solutions in addition to that. We wanna make sure there's ways for our students to be able to make anonymous reports. We wanna make sure there's better ways for our parents to reach out to make sure we can keep people safe, okay? So we're gonna to continue to look at what's out there, both in person and digitally and virtually, in order to better support our students. Again, through grant funds, we were able to add some climate specialists to our safety teams. And what we're gonna to try to do is make sure that not only are we adding these individuals, but we're making sure they have restorative practice training. We're making sure that they have PMT training. And we're making sure they have mindset training, which will help all of the people responding learn to de-escalate situations when they happen. The second key aspect under well-being is our social and emotional learning. Also embedded in that social and emotional learning is trying to build and continue to build strong, authentic relationships with our staff and our students. We want them to have strong, authentic relationships. We're gonna to continue to leverage ruler to do that. We're gonna to continue to leverage restorative practice. So if there is situations or issues, we rebuild that relationship between our students and the staff. Um, and again, we're gonna work with mindset training. All of this under the larger umbrella to create an inclusive and welcoming environment for all students every student in Stratford. Um, speaking of welcoming environments, we've all gone through a lot of years where parents haven't been able to be in our buildings, and it's pretty exciting to start a new year where we're going to be able to welcome our parents back in. We're able to create a space um, that's just a little more inclusive, and we wanna continue to partner with our community to do that, okay? That's an area where we wanna grow, and we've kind of been on hold for two years, so this will be an exciting year for us with that. Um, another focus was our school-based health clinics. Okay, new this year, there'll be a school-based health clinic in Johnson Elementary School. Just so you guys are all aware, this is our sixth school-based health clinic in Stratford. Okay, and the importance of the school-based health clinics is because they help provide resources that support our families overall, our families' well-being. The school-based health clinics do more than just help a kid here and there, right? They reach out, they work with our communities, they work with our families. I think it's pretty great that Stratford's up to having six of them, and we want to grow that in the next three years. We don't want to stop there. Matt, you might be on the next slide by now. Um, along the lines of family well-being, um, one of the areas that was brought up during this committee and all this work was increasing the connection between when families register in Stratford and the services Stratford has to offer them, the community services, making a bridge and a connection. So you don't just register and feel lost, but maybe you register and there's a community already ready to reach out to help you understand where they can find things within Stratford. You're new here. We wanna make you feel more welcome, okay? So that's an area we wanna grow and work on under this umbrella. So that's a lot, and when you think about all of that, you have to also think how are we gonna measure it, right? Because we have to measure it. We have to show that we did this. We have to show that we've accomplished these things. So we're gonna measure this over the next three years by using a lot of different factors. One being attendance for both staff and students. We would like to see increased attendance for both our staff and our students every day that we're open at the public, school, at public schools. Um, participation, not just participation in after school activities, but access. Access to participate in after school activities. We should see an increase in the number of students and students that are all different types of exceptionalities in their ability to participate in our after school activities. Surveys are another data point we will continue to use and look at 
Um, then another data point will be to continue to monitor our student uh, behavior and student discipline data, okay? We might get a little bit of help from the state as they are looking at rolling out DESA, which if they roll out DESA and it's for everybody, that will measure our SEL competencies. So we can also use that over the next three years to kind of show how our students are growing with their SEL competencies as we roll out the ruler lessons. Okay, so I'm gonna leave that right there, but as you hear everyone else, you're gonna keep remembering, oh yeah, she said well-being was in this. So each part that comes next is gonna also have pieces of how we take care of our families and take care of our students. Thank you. And our staff. <laughs> uh, to present the next priority in youth learning, Assistant Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Lindegata. Good evening, everyone. And as Heather said, it's really great to be back. Happy New Year. <laughs> um, of course, meaningful learning, teaching and learning, is a huge part of what we do. Not only for our students, but for our staff as well. Um, the next couple of slides that you will see are pretty hefty a lot of information in them. But I think that it's important for us to sort of set the context for the conversation. So when we think of meaningful learning, um, as we think of it as new learning that supports continuous improvement. And it's improvement in the ability to meet a need or accomplish a goal. For the purposes of this discussion, uh, meaningful learning supports our district vision and mission, and briefly summarized we think of it as ensuring high quality instruction and meaningful learning for all students. The meaningful learning's priority speaks to inclusion, engagement, and inspiration. Those three terms that sort of encapsulate um, the work that we're doing here and the goals that we have set. Um, Richard Elmore was a professor at the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Education and well known for his research and clinical work focused on building capacity for instructional improvement in low performing schools by focusing on the instructional core, which is what we're referring to here, as a way to improve student learning at scale. His work is reflected in Stratford's strategic operating plan and specifically in his priority. He had four areas that he felt we really needed to focus on in order to help students be the best that they could be. First of all, to increase um, teachers' instructional knowledge and skill. And as you look through the uh, bulleted items that we have um, on these slides for meaningful learning, you'll see that many of them focus on um, working with teachers to increase their capacity. So by providing professional learning, not only through workshops and consultants, but also by providing opportunities for teachers to engage in professional conversations and sharing best practices that are successful for students so that we can learn from each other. Secondly, um, Elmore said, we have to increase the level of complexity of the content that students must learn. And in our plan, setting priority learning standards and revising the curriculum um, to reflect the content and skills that our students will need to be successful during their tenure in our district and after. So you can see the overlap in this particular area of our, our portrait of a graduate. Again, speaking to Heather's um, um, presentation, you'll see it, particularly in one of our performance indicators using um, ruler or DESA to also measure student SEL because in order for them to engage we have to make sure that they're provided a, a learning environment that is um, supporting uh, them as learners. Third of all, change the role of the student in the instructional process. This is accomplished in our plan by utilizing instructional strategies so that all students are actively connected to their learning. Again, through professional conversations, through workshops, etc. That's how we help teachers to build their capacity to do that. And finally, we have to enhance the quality of the tasks students are working on by ensuring that our students' tasks are engaging and culturally relevant, productive, and allow multiple ways for students to demonstrate their learning and understanding. The prior, this priority of the strategic operating plan addresses all four areas that I just mentioned. And as you read through the action steps and performance indicators, each one speaks to the student learning improvement and efforts to provide equitable, 
opportunities, and quality learning experiences for our children, collectively and in concert with the other priorities of the Strategic Operating Plan. The meaningful learning strategy is responsive to the achievement and the gap needs of our children and provides access to quality learning opportunities with the appropriate support customized to each student's needs. And I quote from, that was from the beginning of Dr. Sunday's um, work uh, with, the, with the document itself. One of the things we noted is that it's really important for us um, to look at the acronyms that we're using. In this particular slide, I'll, I'll use this as an example because we have several of them here. So looking, obviously, um, PD, many of you might, might think of as professional development, and it is, but sometimes referred to as professional learning uh, and refers to staff, uh, building staff capacity. PLCs refer to our professional learning communities. Um, this year, we're fortunate to have a monthly meeting for teachers to um, be able to share strategies. And one of the um, particular um, presentations that we're making at the administrative retreat this year is on the structure of professional learning throughout the district and um, providing a structure uh, so that we're coherent uh, across the district in those, in those actions. Um, HQI, you've seen before, high quality instruction. <coughs> and SOP, you're familiar with. SIP are the school improvement plans, which are being constructed. We're spending time also in our administrative meeting um, supporting each other in the development of those plans, making sure that there's coherence across the district as well, and that they're directly tied to our strategic operating. Um, I'm happy to report that many of the action steps that you see and the performance indicators that are listed here, um, many of them are in, are in place or um, being developed at this time. And if they're not in place, the plan uh, for moving forward is being constructed. The performance indicators are selected to measure our progress in meeting the strategies over the course of the next three years and all planning and decisions in the meaningful learning priority are connected to our portrait of the graduate, our strategic operating plan, the, the school improvement plans, and our alliance plan. So I look forward to updating the, prog the, the board on our progress, and I appreciate the time you see. Well done. And our next uh, priority will be presented by uh, Joanna Bernard Garth priority on future success. <coughs> Hello. So with this priority, we have the opportunity over the next three years to expand on the work that our school counselors have already been doing in grades six through 12. And we're looking at these success plans and expanding that pre-K through 12. We're also looking at expanding that capacity to have all of us, and meaning parents, students, teachers, uh, administrators, actually see what students are setting for themselves. As Dr. Sunday mentioned, this is about agency. What is the student's goal for the student self? And how do they express that? And how do all of us have the tools and the systems to really look at where is that student and is that student on track? And if that student isn't, what do we need to do to help that student? Right now, some of our systems don't allow us that ease of access. So part of this plan is really looking at what tool, what system is going to help us so that it's really, it's public, it's available, and we can all support students the way we know we want to. Um, the other parts of this include looking at um, what is success, making sure that we all have a shared definition of that for our students. So if we're going to say this is a success, uh, success plan, what do we mean by that? We're also looking at, for Portrait of a Graduate, we have developed rubrics um, for Pre-K 2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. Um, the work in terms of the, the milestones is naturally starting at high school um, because of the mastery credit. We are also, as you saw in multiple languages, working on getting these rubrics translated into Spanish and Haitian Creole because those are our highest language needs to make sure that a whole range of students and parents have access to what we want for our students. Um, we are also looking to build on the goal setting and the student-led conferences that many of our elementary schools were already doing. You know, the pandemic, some things changed, but we know that work has started. We want to expand that and continue that wonderful work. 
the high schools this year are really already looking at reinventing advisory and starting to include the portrait, the success plans, and so that work is beginning. Internships and apprenticeships were already in our district, but as with other things, you know, because of access and COVID, we have not been able to access some of those, so we're really returning to those, bringing those back, so that as students are developing the kinds of things they're excited and interested about, that we can provide them with opportunities to go to different places and build those community partnerships. You know, as we do all this work, and what Heather was mentioning about well-being, we're supporting our students. They're seeing, being seen and heard. Their voices are matter in this success plan. If we do this work, we're looking at, you know, we will see um, increases in terms of the performance indicator for our students who are economically disadvantaged and else. So we'll be able to help move the students, as you saw with Dr. Osundi presented. Um, we're also looking at making sure students have the credits they need. Again, if they're not on try, if we're all working together, we can catch students sooner. Um, and we really want to see students um, enrolled in education and opportunities that allow them to pursue those goals they have for themselves. Thank you. Well done. Okay, and the next uh, priority area is, uh, as we discussed earlier, exceptional talent. Ms. Courtney Brown. It's good to see everyone again. Um, Dr. Gata covered a lot of what, are, what is in these slides on her slide, so I'm gonna focus on the strategies to attract and retain exceptional talent. First, I wanna give you some of the statistics that we have going into the next school year, right now, which are changing by the minute. <laughs> right now, we have a 97% fill rate for certified staff to begin the school year. We have approximately a 90% fill rate for non-certified support staff. Um, traditionally, our turnover rates have been about 5% per year. So the Human Resources Office, in collaboration with the Teaching and Learning Office, will be researching and designing a strategic plan for talent recruitment, development, and retention. We have already begun the work of ramping up recruitment efforts as the nation was beginning to see signs of a teacher shortage. Some of the newer initiatives that have been put into place are the use of the EdSite listserv, and what that does is we email all certified staff um, by subject area endorsement when we have a vacancy. Uh, we also use Handshape, which is a notification to colleges and universities with our vacancies. Um, and we advertise in national publications such as EdWeek. We will continue to work on branding and marketing our district. Our goals, goals will be for the staff to have the best experience uh, from the application process to the onboarding process to the entry into the classroom. In addition, the district will, will be providing professional development and PLCs aligned to district and student achievement goals, as Dr. Gata has already mentioned. We will also research the implementation of a staff recognition program. Through these initiatives, our staff will become a part of the recruitment effort by sharing their positive experiences with other educators, both certified and non-certified. We will continue to strengthen our educator pipeline through partnerships with the universities and educator prep programs currently we are partnered with Southern University of Bridgeport, Sacred Heart and Fairfield U. We are researching additional programs such as the Quinnipiac Residence, Residency Educator Program. We will research partnerships with colleges and universities outside of Connecticut in order to increase, increase the diversity amongst staff. And we will look to expand our current internship and student teaching programs. We will also continue to research our Grow Your Own programs for non-certified staff to become teachers in the future. Our target staff will be non-certified substitutes, CIAs, tutors, or any other support staff interested in becoming a teacher. And lastly, we will research and analyze the substitute pay increase or compensation initiatives in order to attract and improve talent in an increasingly competitive market for substitute teachers. Um, our performance, well, some of our performance indicators will be measured by the retention rates, an increase in retention rates, and an increase in the diversity amongst our support staff and educators. Got it all. Um, Mr. Rivers, I'm going to ask you, okay, so that's the second slide. We're actually going to go to uh, the last part of the area, which is the bedrock of our work as a community, which is family and community partnerships. And uh, Mr. Von Temple will make this presentation. All right. 
So today, um, throughout this presentation, you were able to hear um, in many different ways what we are doing to create access, opportunities, supports for all of our students and staff. Um, so as you can see, our district is truly being intentional when speaking about the importance of including our families and community when it comes to ensuring every student within the district strives. You can see this in the strategic operating plan and the vision and the North Star through the portrait of graduate and then ruler and our uh, alliance plan. We are in the process of hiring a family and community and community engagement specialists to assist in these efforts through the Alliance Grant. So I'm gonna go through some of these and tell you a little bit more about how we can do this. Um, so we're gonna provide clear and consistent two-way communication for our families. So not just, you know, the school saying, hey, come to the school. We're gonna say, families, please come talk to us, right? Tell us what your needs are so we can help um, all of our students succeed. Uh, the good thing about COVID is it gave us options, right? There's so we're looking at <laughs> the only good thing about COVID, it gave us options, right? For working parents, parents, parents with multiple children who cannot go into uh, the schools as much as they want to, but they can always have a, a meeting virtually, right? So we're looking at that. Um, we're also looking at how to um, make sure parents and caregivers come to our administrator-led town hall meetings. We're gonna have those once a semester for every single school. Uh, the Parent Advisory Committee, that's the PTA for some schools, but it also includes other parents also. So we just wanna make sure everyone knows exactly how their voice matters within our schools. Um, so, last but not least on this slide, we will continue to build opportunities to meet with organizations like CARE, which is Strap for Care Citizens Addressing Racial Equity and CERF um, to create family conversations across uh, the district. Can you go to the next slide? All right. Um, again, collaboration is key. Uh, so we had the Sterling House, Stratford Library, Stratford YMCA, Stratford Rotary, Stratford Education Foundation, South End Community Center, Stratford Community Partnership, the Fairfield County Junior mm -hmm. Achievement, um, but also, you know, how do we use our collaborations to best fit uh, everyone involved? So we're looking at different ways to, you know, we might go to a jamboree next Sunday at 10 a.m., you might see a table mm -hmm. um, at Pop Warner, with us recruiting mentors and teachers or any um, positions that we have. We also have a partnership with the Sterling House to have a table beginning in September 24th, um, a couple Saturdays each month to really recruit people to come work for our district. So we're looking at different ways to, uh, to include our community in our process of recruiting people to not only work for us, but also mentor our children because our children need that, right? So, uh, so we're exploring other opportunities for, uh, well, I'll say this. We, we are in Stratford. A big company is here, but we don't have a large co uh, uh, connection with them, right? So we're looking at how do we get back to being connected with Sikorsky. That is like a major goal for our district, right? It's very important because it offers positions for our students in their junior year, if we're in, into a specific program, <laughs> for their junior year, and also for them to see opportunities of working uh, right out of uh, high school. So we're definitely looking at the different ways that our communities could you know, help us, and of course our colleges, our universities, uh, and please do not forget our local uh, community colleges either, right? Because they are very important. Uh, a lot of our positions, and this is a small little plug, we are hiring classroom instructional assistants. <laughs> so you can have an associate's degree, and you can also, uh, you know, you could also have a bachelor's degree, all right? So we, we are hiring. Um, and so performance indicators, meeting agendas, 
so you know everything is public, right? So our agendas are online, so please attend when you can. Uh, notices, we try to use our Twitter account, social media, LinkedIn, all of that, all of the good stuff, right? So we're trying to get uh, every generation to understand the importance of working here or giving our students opportunities. Uh, and of course, we want to see an increase of stakeholders understanding um, what we do and seeing it in our surveys. So I believe that's it, Dina. That's it for me. Thank you. I think you all stole the show. <laughs> um, you know, what is, uh, this, has been, this has been really a joy for me to be a part of, uh, really starting with that first session that we had with the facilitator and just seeing the conversations. Board members involved in this process, we included students in this process, seeing how passionate people were about the Stratford Public Schools. Now, what's magical about this, and it's important to really highlight, is that this is a three-year plan. Okay, and as I said, I uh, think as the presentation evolved through the evening, it's very clear that um, regardless of our external context, if two years from now the external context changes, the priorities that were determined by the planning team do not need to change. But the strategies that you just heard people speak about are adaptable uh, to the context. You heard Dr. Gator reference this notion of making sure we create some level of coherence and alignment across our 13 schools. What has been happening over the last couple of weeks, and our administrators got back in this week, we spent about eight hours today at Stratford High for our leadership meetings, is a lot of the school-based school improvement plans are directly attached to what you see right here. So it's been very interesting and very refreshing to see the conversations that our leaders are having about how they will adapt it to their own specific context, and then how they're gonna to look to implement some of these strategies throughout the course of the year. So, Exciting times in front of us. Absolutely. Well, thank you to everybody who presented. That was amazing. I'm super excited about what I just heard. It sounds really great. Would do any board members have questions? <laughs> Mr. Kennedy, do you have a question? I don't know. Take it. Well, he'll come back. Yeah. Ms. Kipi, did you have a question? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you've said it multiple times. Super excited about this plan. Um, I've been really anxious, right, <laughs> to, to, to see the final um, presentation, and now just looking forward to its um, approval first, right, <laughs> and then implementation. Now, my question is, with this being um, a plan for roughly three years, as they were going through the different sections, um, there were some of the performance indicators um, or measuring, right, like the tools to give us the results of those performance indicators, it was stated that they weren't all in place yet, right? So my question is, do we have a list of those? What is the timeline to getting them in place so that we can have a plan with a full kind of three-year um, run? Yeah, so um, there are some things that are actively in motion. Uh -huh. um, and for the ones that are respective to each building, uh, I'm giving our leaders the economy to adapt and adjust as they see fit, knowing that there's a three-year three piece. As we continue to track the performance indicators, and you'll see, again, uh, through the five different uh, priority areas, some of these performance indicators are directly out of the lines or the, the, the accountability index. Um, but we're gonna continue to work with our leaders to provide them the resources for them to map out the sequence for implementation, and that's what they're really working on right now. So my concern with that is, and I get that part of our work is around um, creating consistency across our schools. Um, we haven't necessarily had that. So again, history kind of, you know, you can only go based off of the history, right? Until I see evidence of um, that change. Are you setting timelines for them to say, you, yes, I'm giving you the autonomy to come up with this plan, um, but I need by X to have this completed. I need, in order to back into completing this plan and fulfilling this vision and you know our dreams, are you setting certain timelines for them that you're holding them accountable on and that as we meet as a board talking to you, we're also getting updated. Like this is in full you know, motion here, et cetera. 
We are, and that's the process we're going through right now. Okay. So one of the things that we always look to do, and it's very similar to what we do through the appraisal process, is to make sure it's a mutually agreed upon conversation. Okay. They have to have the confidence that it can implement it within a timeline that's reasonable for them. Mm -hmm. um, for me, given uh, the focus that we have on uh, through the alliance designation, a lot of the uh, meaningful lear learning pieces mm -hmm. are in place. Now, from a, from a, a district strategic plan, um, some of these processes will be monitored from district level through different district leaders' offices, mm -hmm. right? So they have the autonomy to set the timeline, but we're also in the process of um, uh, screening and trying to bring some people in that can support the work of school leaders through the SIP. Okay. Um, and that person will have an architectural say on the timeline as well. Okay, and are you presenting some of that data to us on a, whatever the cadence may be? So maybe it's a quarterly, depending on what is being measured, Maybe it's at the end of the year, et cetera. I don't want to wait until the end of the year when Ed site gets updated to see how my school is doing. You know right, what I mean? Right. So there's, there's a couple different ways to answer that question. So we, we always look to have a major check-in mm -hmm. okay, in our progress around mm -hmm. these things. Uh, unfortunately, school districts in the state of Connecticut and across the country do not have assessment data until the second semester. Mm -hmm. okay? um, and our state performance data typically don't come out until some point in the summer. Mm -hmm. So most of the time when we have the opportunity to present any kind of performance improvement data to the board will typically happen in the fall. Okay. So for example, um, the AP scores come back in, I think, shortly before or after, after July 4th, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. SPAC scores, as you, you know, we all went to the CAPE workshop the other day and you heard a GP speak about uh, its release and those are queued up to come out uh, pretty soon. Mm -hmm. um, once we have that data and we able to synthesize it in a very digestible format, we will present that to the board. There will be a lot more presentations on data performance because that's a focus for the district. And Madam Chair, one last question. So, um, the I, you know, there are benchmarks, right, for each of these kind of performance indicators. Um, is that information available for us to review? Because I just want to see kind of where we are now, and as you start to present to us like the results of these um, changes and improvements. I kind of, I am in data a lot, so I apologize. <laughs> uh, I do want to be able to see like, you know, our, our growth, Based our progress, people. and yeah. you know, being able to ask like, okay, so why are we still here, and how far did we expect to go? Like having those kinds of discussions. Yes, of course. Okay. Um, the data does exist. Uh, Ms. Majari and Garb uh, did the synthesis this summer. Um, I have it queued up to add to the agenda for a presentation in September. Okay. Well, you know what? It's like All we've worked that? with you yeah. for a year now, right? And we are still learning, right? That dance, right? And this is our new plan kind of thing. So I just want to set expectations of what I want to mm -hmm. see. All of you may have, but it sounds like we're yeah. together, right? <laughs> awesome. Exciting. Mr. Kennedy, since I can't see your face, do you have any questions? You do. Go for it. I don't. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay, too. Um, wonderful. That was a great presentation. I really appreciate everybody um, and what they presented to us this evening. Uh, we will move on to our administrative executive reports. Dr. Sunday Yard again. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, welcome to a new start of the school year uh, for our audience at home and for our district team. This has been a very busy summer, very productive summer. Uh, I think you know the highlight of our summer work is the finalization and presentation of the strategic plan that will govern our day-to-day -day work. Um, but there's been some big things that we've done throughout the course of the summer. So uh, with that said, we're excited to bring back our professional community. We're welcoming, we're welcoming almost 7,000 children into our buildings. Um, we're excited about that. Some important dates to note. Uh, August 29th, our staff come back. We have convocation. The entire Board of Education is expected to be there and help us welcome back our staff. Uh, this year, we are doing our convocation at Bonnell High School, home of the Bulldogs. Okay. So mark your calendars, August 29th, which is the next Monday. I had a chance to look at the weather right now, and I think we're going to be in good shape. Okay. Uh, it's early in the morning. It starts at 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Just send that information. Okay, make it <laughs> We'll oh, film it. I think Lou's going to be there, so we'll have it, we'll have it on film. Um, we're excited about that. Um, 
And you know, our administrators got back this week. The full suite of administrators are here. Our staff will be back next week. Uh, one of the things that you family should expect and start to see is increased communication. It's been happening in increments from different schools. Um, but our, our, our administrators are sending out communication to make sure, sure families have the adequate information to prepare the kids for return back to school. As part of that, uh, as it's been over the last couple of years, and it always will be, is a focus on health and safety. Um, you should have, our family should have received a letter from, um, from Kim Velasquez last, last Thursday or Friday, okay? It's very important that our families read the letter. If they have questions, they reach out to us. Uh, because when we welcome back our students, uh, we need to make sure that we do so in the safest uh, fashion possible. So I'm looking forward to a, a strong year. Uh, we had a very vulnerable conversation with our leadership team when we talked about the importance of creating the conditions to allow our teachers to do the best work and creating the conditions to allow our students to uh, thrive as learners and grow as individuals. And that's going to be the expectation for the 22-23 uh, school year. And I'm happy to sit again side by side with Board of Education uh, as we go through the next 182 days. Okay, spectacular. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Sunday? Ms. Carol Fabian. Um, just to kind of follow up from um, something that we discussed in June, early June, um, regarding the like reallocation of staff for buildings that had greater needs. Mm -hmm. um, has anything been done to further that, or is there a time that we'll expect to see um, shifts? Uh, I, I believe we got a lot of that accomplished in, in June. Is there a specific uh, building or? Well, I know one of like um, my greatest concerns was Johnson House um, and how you know some school all the schools had two reading specialists and one math coach and just based on size and need um, and performance if we were going to shift it so that where we are putting more staff where the need is yeah so if you recall we did reinstate that position uh, but one of the things that we said in June was that we are going to go through our enrollment numbers and when things uh, settle uh, and we're going to analyze that against the first day of school if it calls for the need that will make uh, the necessary shifts. To Miss Carol Fabian's point, I think you know we want to ensure that there is not necessarily an equal distribution of resources, but an equitable distribution of resources across the district. Um, so we hope to hear an update on that uh, and see it reflected in the buildings. Yes, ma'am. Uh, just to follow up, that there's been a lot of discussion around. Um, positions that are held by grant funding and things like that. Can we have a list of those positions that are open and held by grant funding? Yes, thank you, Janet, with that report. Great, thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Kennedy? Do you have any questions for Dr. Sunday? No. Okay. No. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I was waiting because I talked <laughs> a lot the last time, so. <laughs> you are up. Um, you mentioned, um, you know, increased uh, communication, and so I've, <clears throat> I've been concerned about um, the engagement level of our community in, at large, not just the school population, but our larger Stratford community in our process, because what, the work that we do impact everyone, whether they have children in our schools or not. And so um, I was just at a um, leadership conference, a summer leadership conference at CAVE, and one of our breakout sessions included um, community engagement. And so I asked, you know, like what were other um, districts doing in terms of engaging their community? And one thing, it, several superintendents there were using um, Thrillshare, I think it's called. And I think our website, or at least our mobile website, is somehow connected to that. Mm -hmm. And they have the ability to send communication blasts to anyone in the community. So I would love for us to incorporate something like that in our communication because we don't have a communication committee as a board. And again, I, I struggle with budget time comes and so many community members are, I did not know that. Or I've heard fam parents say, well, we get emails about everything, but we don't know when your meetings are happening, right? Like I would love for us to include our meetings even in those weekly district updates whatever we can do to inform the public, because um, again, like I said, what we do affects everyone. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, we have uh, 50, approximately 52,000 people mm -hmm. in the community mm -hmm. of Stratford, and uh, our school district 
probably represents about 25% of that population, mm -hmm. right? Um, we know that loud and clear. Um, I don't, I'm not deeply familiar with Thrillshare. I know through Actigy, yes. it's, it's, it's plugged, and I'll have deeper conversations with our, our uh, technology director on that, so I'm a little bit more familiar in this capacity. We do leverage communication for people who are in our database, mm -hmm. okay, in Power School. That's the reach of our audience right now, beyond the other, maybe social media, or the website, or YouTube, so on and so forth. And then things that are posted um, locally. I see uh, board clerk, Teresa, raising her hand. I, I just wanted to add in there that the district news that goes out weekly mm -hmm. does also include some of our community partners. Mm -hmm. I think a group in there for different community partners that we did that publication yeah. as well. Well, I think now that we do have a pretty brand new fancy website, we can put up one of those pop-ups that say sign up for our updates and the public can literally enter their email address and get added to our database and classified as public, kind of, whatever we want to do, you know. <laughs> but again, just thinking about it and in terms of the execution, again, that's in your thing, right? But it's kind of like, here's the vision. We want to increase that communication. Uh, we'll definitely give you some strong consideration. Thank you. Anybody else? Great, thank you very much, Dr. Sunday. Um, moving on to uh, Ms. Mangini. Yes, if you can again. Um, as Dr. Sunday pointed out, we really did have a very productive summer within my area. We looked at a lot of our policies that fall under the 3000 series, which is business operations. So stay tuned, you'll probably have a couple of new policy requests as well as some revised ones. Um, in addition, as we just discussed at our finance committee meeting, you did in fact receive your fiscal year 2031st monthly report for the month of July, which really doesn't give you a whole lot of information yet, it's very early in the fiscal year. Um, so we will continue to update that. Fiscal year 22, we are closing out the year with the annual um, education financial system report. It's called the EFS, and I always have to remind myself what that stands for, because for many years it was called the ED-001 report. Um, so it, it has a little different, not only a different name, but a very different um, process, which honestly, to the Connecticut State Department of Education's credit, they did a fabulous job in updating it. It's a much easier report to navigate through, and it gives some wonderful information um, about equity throughout our school. Um, but that is due by September 1st. We're moving along on that. And as soon as we wrap that up and we deal with our partners over at the town side with adjusting entries, we will get to the board um, the fiscal year 22 final report as well. And lastly, I just wanted to emphasize some news about the school lunch program and free meals. I think it's really important that our families understand that there are two different programs that the district is currently operating under. The first will provide free breakfast and lunch at six of our elementary schools for the entire school year. And that is a program that's been ongoing called the Community Eligibility Provision Program under the State of Connecticut and the USDA. That will continue throughout the year. The second program that we are going to be operating under is a state program that is funded through some of the Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds. It's known as SMART which stands for the School Meals Assistance Revenue for Transition Funds. I emphasize that because that is a temporary program. The Stratford Public Schools received $536,000 as its allotment. And that is our total allotment as of right now from which we will draw down for as long as those funds last, we can provide all of our schools with free meals and free breakfast. We did some calculations. We anticipate that those funds will last us through the end of December, probably right up until the holiday break. And we will definitely analyze that each and every month and keep our families informed. I do want to emphasize, however, the importance of free and reduced 
uh, meal application. I really want to encourage our families, even if they're not sure they qualify, to complete the application. Um, the income eligibility requirements have changed this year. All of this information can be found on the website. We will also hopefully by the end of next week have a completely online application for our families with the um, eligibility requirements on there. And two wonderful things that can happen from a lot of those applications being completed. One of course is hopefully more of our families will learn that they are entitled to free or reduced priced meals. And also the more that we have that are qualified, it could possibly provide us with more of the smart funds from the state and that would extend the period of time that we can give all students free lunches. So the really good news is everyone will return to school with free breakfast and free lunch. We're hopeful again that that will be through December and we will definitely communicate that to our families. So that's our exciting news. Um, stay tuned. <laughs> Just Thank to clarify, you. the six schools that will be receiving the free, uh, the free meals all year are Lordship, Nichols, uh, Soto, Johnson House, Franklin, Franklin, Franklin and Second Hill Lane. Second. Uh, and then uh, the other three elementary schools, as well as the two middle schools and the two high schools, will be eligible for those uh, transitional free meals. You are absolutely correct. Excellent. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Ms. Mangini. Any questions for Ms. Mangini? Ms. Keeley, did you, are you raising your hand? Yes. I, I failed to ask this in the committee meeting, sure. but um, could you confirm or clarify this $536,000 uh, $36, when you did your projection to see how long we could offer this, how many schools were you calculating? We were calculating the remaining. The remaining, okay, good. Because that was my question. I'm like, I did not ask, like, is that, you know, I should have known because you're an expert at this, but I just want to make sure. <laughs> no, quite frankly, I'm glad you asked because um, Sodexo helped me with the calculation and I asked them the same question. Okay, <laughs> and then lastly, um, with Soto now being a preschool, do we offer them free lunch and, and breakfast? Yes. Are they part of, okay, so when There still are students, and I did There's clarify okay. that with the state. I, get, I ask because I just, you know, with preschool kind of working a little different, yeah. I just want to make no, sure. Okay, questions. thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Mangini? Mr. Kennedy, any questions for Ms. Mangini? No. Okay, great, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Dr. Gaeta. <laughs> Well, there's been a lot going on. We had well over 900 students participate in summer programs this, this summer. So really exciting, active time. Um, first of all, the extended school year program for our students with exceptionalities. Uh, Dan Hicks was the administrator there, overseen by Heather Borges and other members of the PPS department. The location was at Soto and Flood, and our goal was to provide students with an individualized, engaging, and fun summer experience that helps them to retain their school year learning. We had 400 students from pre-K through age 21 from each school, representing each school in Stratford. They were staffed by 25 teachers, 76 CIAs and tutors, 22 other staff, and four partner organizations. That was a huge huge program and very successful. Um, our elementary program for students in grades K through six was a two, um, a two session program. Uh, it was um, eight days, I'm sorry. Uh, we had two eight day sessions. So in other words, two weeks, twice. Planned by Susan Schmidt and Sam Rosenberg, Samantha. The administrator was Rob Battieri. They were located at the Franklin School, and their goal was to provide an additional 28 hours of, of added learning time in foundational reading, intensive writing, math strategies, and fluency, as well as SEL and hands-on STEM um, activities. There were 13 uh, teachers and one <coughs> nurse, um, as well, and we had 273 students participate in that program. In the same location, we had Kickstart Kindergarten, we know that there are um, students who are scheduled to enter kindergarten this fall who have not had preschool experience. And so the focus here was to provide students with an opportunity to experience a regular kindergarten structure, 
focusing on routines, SEL, and developmentally appropriate content and skills with a ratio of five students to one adult in the classroom. Uh, we had 40 students participate in that session. The secondary uh, program for middle school and high school students uh, was um, located at Stratford High School and the administrators were Jim Noga and Brian Kowalski with support from um, the high school administration. Uh, the goal was primarily credit recovery, but there was an enrichment opportunity as well for students. There were 25, 24 staff members involved, and the attendance was um, 196 high school students and 19 middle school students. We had seven seniors complete courses for graduation, 171 high school students successfully complete 287 courses, and 18 middle school students successfully complete 24 courses. The enrichment program was Milestone C. Uh, they ran two sessions, uh, eight days apiece, uh, two hours a day, and they used flight uh, control systems and monitors to simulate flight, and students were also introduced to flying in drones. Um, also, um, sort of uh, in the staff area, we had our new staff orientation, uh, August 11th, 12th, 15th, 16th, and 17th. We had uh, 20 participants per session, of approximately um, an average of 20 participants per session, located at Stratford High. And our goal is to provide information from, about our school district, including SEL practices, daily routine questions, and opportunities to meet with their content area coordinators and new colleagues, other Stratford teachers and community members. They also had a chance to learn about the town through a tour. Um, and staff professional learning is ongoing this summer. We have a lot of curriculum writing being done, AP training, teachers who are gonna be teaching AP courses. Um, we have uh, the PERFORM, it's a new platform for uh, our teacher uh, or educator evaluation. We have the Danielson framework coming up uh, this Friday and also on Tuesday, which is our, will be next year, next school year, the 23-24 school year, our new evaluation program and the administrators retreat for chapters for us on East Orchard. So, <laughs> we're not in summer, but really active and engaging, so thank you. That's great, thanks for that update. Any questions for Dr. Gaeta? Yes, ma'am. That was a lot. It was. <laughs> I think you started off saying there were like about 900 students who participated in the summer program, right? 900 total. 928. Yeah. Oh, 928. And just, you know, again, for my, because I don't know all this stuff, how are you measuring the success of those programs to say, well, next year we should do this again? Like, are you, you know, assuming there's a component to this that is to improve academics and, you know, things of that nature, are you tagging students who participate? in this and when you look at their test results you're saying okay these students were part of this program and they did how are you looking at this data it's interesting that you ask that because we've had the opportunity to offer for example the elementary program through the ESSER funds mm -hmm. so the last two summers were um were th this was available to mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. so um actually following through um I know that Samantha Rosenberg and Sue, our constituent, are also looking at those students. I think the thing that, um, for the most part, has been helpful for us is the information that the teachers who are um, involved in that program utilize their own, the data that the students bring with them. They're provided with that data so that they can really um, focus on you know, addressing the needs that those students have. Sorry, so going back to my question. Are you seeing this data about our students when, because as overseeing this, yeah. you know, department mm -hmm. or pro, you know, are you looking at this yourself to say, hey, this is how, you know, when Sam or Sue, you know, like they're looking at, are you seeing that data yourself? Is that data available? How often are you looking at it? What kind of insights are you getting from it? Because I'm just curious. Well, one of the things that we know for sure is what's happening at the high school level because students are attaining credit there. 
tons of hay, and, and now I, I reported back to you that they actually patented 287 courses they completed mm -hmm. uh, there. The elementary students will begin this year at the you know at their at their school, and so we'll be able to um, track them and how they're doing. We also have to provide a report to the State Department mm -hmm. um, for the use of ESSER funds. So all of the data in terms of their performance is submitted to the state as well. Okay. So you said we've been offering this now for a couple of years, right? With the two summer. This two is our summers. Summer. Yes. So mm -hmm. you would have like two summers worth of data yeah. that you're looking at. Like well, is right. that so far one? One okay. summer. Right. And have you and so my question was how you're looking at that in conjunction with their performance, performance academically. Sort of, Do you right. have that? Is that something you can share with the board? I, well, by student, students? No, just in, as cohort, yeah. right? Like these yeah. students participate. Because mm -hmm. I guess Dr. Sunday had done, um, you had done a presentation uh, briefly about a program that you piloted where roughly like 100 students participated in it and they performed well SAT. on SAT. their essay, right? So again, I'm looking for how are we looking at the information? Like we're spending this money on these programs. We need to know that it's working and if it's not, how do you reconfigure to make it work? I, I can get that information for you. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Yeah. Okay, any other questions for Dr. Yeah. Ms. Kennedy, do you have any questions no. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Moving on to our consent agenda, I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda, which includes the meeting minutes from June 7th regular meeting, from August 9th special meeting, the approval of uh, two overnight field trips, one to uh, Stratford High School to Orlando, Florida, and one Bonnell High School to Paris, France, and Barcelona, Spain and also this month's personnel document. So moved. So moved by Ms. Wolsey. Second. Second by Ms. Keefe. Do we have any discussion? Yes, Ms. Keefe. So in the personnel document, I was looking because I know at the end of last um, academic year, um, we learned that the interim assistant principal at um, Stratford Academy, um, that contract ended, right? Like and I didn't see any replacement hire in the personal document, so I was curious, are we starting the school year without an AP, or is that position filled, but it just didn't make our document, like any update on that? Correct, uh, that was Ms. Thomas Field, it was filled with income. Uh, Ms. Ebony Sowell will be returning back to Johnson House. Oh. Okay, seeing none, we'll have a roll call vote. 
Ms. QB? Yes. Ms. Wilsey? Yes. Ms. Carol Fabian? Yes. Mr. Kennedy? Ms. Fidel? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes 6 0. Moving on to number three, I will entertain a motion for the Stratford Board of Education to approve the educational specifications for Stratford Academy Johnson House dated August 2nd, 2022 for submission to the State Department of Education as part of a grant application for flooring abatement and replacement at Stratford Academy Johnson House. Okay. So moved by Ms. Kupi, second by Ms. Fulte. Any uh, discussion? That will be on the same time frame? Yes. Um, Mr. Kennedy, any discussion, questions? No. Okay, seeing none, I'll entertain a roll call vote. Uh, I think I, yeah, sorry, I mucked up the word. <laughs> we'll have a roll call vote. Ms. Vidal? Yes. Mr. Kennedy? Yes. Ms. Carol Fabian? Yes. Mrs. Wilsey? Yes. Ms. Kupi? Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes 6 0. Uh, moving on to tabled items. Would anybody like to entertain a motion to? residency regularly and quarterly reports are coming and there's been a lot of motion towards taking care of um, you know proper residency policy and, and surrounding the topic the state enrollment report is due October 1st right so I assume that we'll have a residency report thereafter we're not going to see I'm hoping we can get you a complete report um, as you know we just hired somebody uh, to succeed in our previous uh, Person who's, who's leading that work. Um, so once the person gets on board, it really gets settled down. Um, that can really um, impact in a favorable way the quality of the report. Great, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ms. Kupi. Um, we were at the CAVE uh, leadership meeting uh, for a conference last week, and one of the things that came up was um, that, I mean, the whole conference was really around. I'm just wondering if it's possible for us to have an executive session at some point with the city hire. Um, our um, you know, chief police could be a part of it just to brief the board on our school safety plan because I understand that that is sensitive material, but as a board, we do need to understand to a level that most of the public wouldn't, and that way we can also Any other discussion? Mr. Kennedy? Nope. Okay, I will entertain a motion to retable residency. So, so moved by Mrs. Wilkie. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Fidel. All in favor? Aye. 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 Residency is back on the table. Uh, moving on to committee assignments and reports. Curriculum committee met August 16th. Ms. Carol Fabian, do you have an update for us? Sure. So, um, two of the major things that we discussed at the last curriculum meeting were the two field trips. One is going to be done by the Stratford High School um, band. They will be traveling to Orlando, Florida. They will be performing at several different locations throughout Disney, um, Universal Studios, and throughout there, they will get some time to enjoy the parks as well. This will take place over um, the April break time um, with many different fundraising and uh, chaperones and ways to help um, lower that cost for those students. The second um, overnight field trip application that we discussed and we approved was for both Bunnell High School and Stratford High School students to um, travel to Paris, France and Barcelona, Spain. That would occur over the April break. Um, it is a planned out trip. They will see many of the various um, sites of both um, locations and get to enjoy the culture and be submerged in the language and the transportation between and the flights and all of that. Um, 
And again, one of the discussions with that was really ways to help lower that cost um, and different fundraisers and perhaps like sponsors, looking into sponsorships from the community to help bring that cost down so that the trip can be more accessible to all um, interested students. And lastly, um, one of the things that we um, were um, presented with was by Dr. Gaeta, the new um, curriculum writing template, which was wonderful because then later, mm -hmm. um, the next two days later, um, it was something that we were presented at the CAVE conference, leadership conference, showing um, the various ways and how well it aligns with what the state is expecting. And it'll be a great tool for our staff when they're writing new curriculum. And it'll be a great resource for our teachers, giving them the different um, ways that they can access other materials, free materials, websites, and ways to reach all of our students. So whether it is having a class that has multiple levels or students with exceptionalities or students with another language as their primary, it will give teachers the resource to implement what is best for each of those children. That was all exciting stuff. Yeah. Great. Um, Mr. Kennedy, do you have anything to add? I don't. I'm excited for those students to, to get to travel again. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Ms. Kupi, anything to add? No, she covered it all. Yeah. all right, Great wonderful. job. I know we had been wondering, um, uh, is this trip to Europe uh, uh, like a new <laughs> phenomenon? Or, I mean, obviously <laughs> a pause for before. COVID. Has it happened before? They have. Yeah. yeah. They they used spectacular. Yeah. That's good times. I only got to go to Washington, D.C. <laughs> which is also <laughs> spectacular. Europe is wonderful. I did ask how we can get on that. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> really, that is awesome stuff. Great. Thank you guys so much. Um, Finance Committee, Mrs. Wilty, we met a little bit earlier. We sure did. Um, we had a quick meeting before the board meeting, and we learned from Ms. Mangini that we are actively closing 2022. We're predicted to be in the black, which is a good news. Um, I think the best news that we've heard is what a, a lot of our families have been asking about is our lunch program. Um, but I think that the importance really needs to be stressed for families to use the online access of um, filling out that application, not only to see that they um, may be eligible, but to increase our percentage of actually return. And our next meeting, um, I know it's said to be determined on our agenda, but it is September 19th at 6.30. That's it. Great, thank you very much. Uh, school plan and planning committee. Did not meet. Did not meet. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, liaison. Um, I know Mr. Hendrick isn't here, but uh, uh, do you have an update for us, Mr. Bell? Uh, we weren't able to meet. Okay. Summertime stuff. Summertime stuff. All right. Well, thank you. We look forward to an update next month. A uh, policy review, Ms. Cupy, Ms. Bedell. We didn't meet. Since took the, the last summer meeting. Yes. Took the <laughs> summer off. We were out. <laughs> All right. And athletic review, Mr. Kennedy. Same thing. Took the summer off. Excellent. <laughs> I support that wholeheartedly. Excellent. Good stuff. Other committees, uh, Kay, Ms. Cupy, I know we had our the leadership conference last week. Anything else to add? Yes, we did um, have the summer leadership conference at CAVE. The keynote speaker was the commissioner, Dr. Charlene Russell Tucker. Um, the focus of the um, conference was around school uh, safety, as I mentioned um, before. Um, myself, Mrs. Wiltsey, Mrs. Carol Fabian, and Dr. Sunday were all in attendance. Um, I thought it was a valuable uh, workshop, frankly. Um, and, you know, I, I took away several things that, as you've heard throughout this meeting, I brought up in conversation. Um, so, yeah, I, another um, takeaway was um, the importance of student voice. Like, that was a really big one. And I know that um, we have, you know, student uh, representatives, but during that conference, it was discussed in terms of how you utilize those student voices, not just getting updates of the activities going on in school, but they have a lot of important things to say. And we need a bigger table, and we need to have them and get their thoughts on you know the things that we're we're discussing and deciding because it is about them, right? Um, so hopefully we can kind of improve upon um, how we're incorporating their voices. Absolutely. Thank you. I was going to add the yes. exact thing oh, yeah. about <laughs> student yeah. representatives being more than just date keepers, mm -hmm. um, but really sitting at the table with us and having a voice in a lot of the decisions we make. Yeah. Um, that was a great takeaway. We heard from two students, one yeah. from uh, Windsor and one from Amity. Yeah. 
one was his former student. <laughs> and um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that the, the theme of it was the sky is not the limit. Mm -hmm. So it was very uh, galaxy focused and it was exciting that, you know, we're not putting a, a limit on our students. So it was, it was a great afternoon. Sounds yeah. wonderful. I'm sorry I missed it, uh, but it sounds great. There's another one in November. Um, <laughs> CES did not meet over the summer, so I will update you guys next month. Um, renovation, building needs. It's I was Monday. Yes. Uh, I have no update on anything. Uh, any other committee reports to share? Seeing none. Moving on to general good and welfare. Does anybody have anything they'd like to discuss during the general good and welfare? Oh, we do have something to share. Oh, yes. 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 Um, we had over 200 teachers attend the book giveaway this past weekend at the Vicki Soto Memorial Fund Library mm -hmm. office space. So thank you to everyone who did come. We are completely empty. So that's very good news. There's a lot of full classroom libraries for the start of school. And if anyone has books that they're cleaning out from their classrooms or from their homes, please feel free to drop them off and we will recycle them and get them into classrooms. That is really exciting. So much for and that. Yep. For myself, it's um, shout out to Sterling House, who this past weekend did their um, back to school backpack and school supply giveaway. And if I recall correctly, they gave away like over 250 backpacks. Um, so, you know, thanks to uh, the volunteers who were there helping, but also to the people who donated. I heard like somebody showed up at the last minute, like 100, you know, and just seeing our little faces there picking out their own, like they're like, this is what I want, and they're so excited, and being able to just contribute to sending our kids back to school with dignity, and just that pride, I loved it, so that is, yes. <laughs> that is spectacular, I love this good news. Anyone else, Ms. Carol Fabian, you got anything for us? <laughs> Ms. Bedell? <laughs> Mr. Kathy? I don't know. He's on vacation now, so <laughs> <laughs> that's good and welfare, <laughs> spectacular. And I would just like to add that uh, as a board member, I'm excited for the start of school. As a parent, I'm even more excited for the start of school. And uh, I can't wait uh, to see the great things that happen in Stratford during this school year. So I'm very excited to see where we go from here. Uh, uh, does anybody have anything else? Great. So motion to adjourn. Uh, <laughs> okay, motion to adjourn at 9.09. Second by Ms. Bedell. All in favor? Aye.